Welcome to another series of Local Rock Stars. Today we're with Ben Ortlip. He's my rock star when it comes to things going on with culture, like culture at your business or culture in your family and things like that. So Ben's agreed to be with us and talk to us a little bit about what he's discovered about culture. And so Ben, thank you for being here. Absolutely. And um, tell us a little bit, you know, you know, how did you kind of get to the point to where you thought, you know what, culture is something that I really think we can go deep on. Well, I wanted to know what culture was. Um, I've been writing leadership and management content for all kinds of different people for many, many years. And then I started hearing people talk about culture. Um, I remember one of the magazines that I edit, was the editor of for uh, a season, uh, you know, the, the theme of the whole thing was culture. And I remember thinking, wow, that is, you know, that's just the word has kind of a vibey feel. And mm -hmm. so culture came on to the scene as something that everybody was talking about. But I remember thinking, you know, I didn't really know what it was. I just knew that it was the, the word that you used it when was there sexy. was sexy. When, when, you know, when you couldn't put your finger on something that, that made an impact on you, you would call it, it's just the culture. And so I noticed everybody talking about that. And the way my mind works, I couldn't help wanting to sort of reverse engineer yeah but what is that how did, what caused that feeling of hey that's their culture because when the culture is bad you just know you don't want to have anything to do with it and when the culture is good you just know that i don't know what it is but i want to be part of it so, so who are some good cultures who's some well, i mean everybody culture? talks about google google's a great culture um you know chick-fil-a has a you know renowned culture and i think what one of the things that it is consistency is one of the things that people notice about it. That's when they say it's just the, their culture. You know, we all run into hit or miss people who do things well and then something doesn't happen well. We never say that's their culture. It's only when we see consistently something happening that we become convinced that it's really in their DNA. That's what we mean when we say mm. it's part of their culture. We're talking about some kind of a brand DNA that regardless of the artifact that shows what it is, we just know that it's reliably going to come from them no matter what happens. So what are the main parts of culture? What are the main pieces of it? Well, ironically, culture is just the byproduct of the same old blocking and tackling that we've always done. The challenge today with producing culture on purpose is that the complexity of the world today, there's so many moving parts that it's really gotten, gotten more and more difficult to predictably produce an outcome. You know, if you have a company with 20 employees, you know, how can you just get farther and farther away from the customer encounter? And so how do I make sure that what I want to happen happens? So the charge is to try to create an organizational culture that's similar to what you would be if it were just the you culture standing there interacting with the customer. And it's, um, you know, the, but at the end of the day, when you're running an organization, um, the way that you create culture is through the same disciplines of management and leadership. And um, it's not so much about creating the vibe around your company the way a lot of people think it is. You know, that if we have different colored balloons, then we have a fun, festive culture. Or if we have, Thank you know, you. library books everywhere, then that gives us, you know, a, a studious culture or but it's not that at all it's it's and and there's another topic here that comes up immediately when you start talking about culture and it's engagement and now that's a big word in big companies right but engagement happens right here and you'll notice like if we started talking about bass fishing or something like that there would either be an attraction that would create, you know, that would draw us both right. to this topic. Because we liked it. Or if we were talking about ballet, maybe. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with ballet. <laughs> but, you know, depending on what, what it is that's teed up, right. the, you know, the core value that we're teeing up, any one of us would either be naturally drawn toward it or drawn away. Well, engagement is that thing that draws us to something or not. Mm -hmm. And so there are things, when you go back to this organization, when you got 10 or 20 people there, there are things that you can do to create engagement. 
engagement's like a magnetic knob that you can turn wow. and it causes people to come to this thing that you're creating together or if you neglect it it causes them to drift away wow and so what you are as a culture your your cultural dna or your corporate personality it could be anything but it still the strength that always revolves around the level of attraction that you create to them and that's like with employees as well as customers yeah it, it the in the old days it used to be that an organization would be whatever it was on the inside and then you would fly up to New York and go to Madison Avenue and see one of the ad agencies there and you would purchase an external facing brand and they would give you a logo, they would give you a fancy headline, they would write a jingle and sing it for you, they would create a label that goes on your product and it had nothing to do with who you were as a company. It was all based on the research out in the marketplace of what they discovered that customers would be attracted to. Well, nowadays, because of social media and the internet and how connected our world is, that internal culture has to be exactly the same as what's on the front label. And, if it's, match. and if it's not, then you'll go down as a hypocrite within a matter of weeks because they'll point out, people will point out the inconsistency between what you're trying to sell us and who you really are on the inside. Um, so those things do just, they have to match each other. And so the goal today is to create a strong culture. And this has never been this way before uh, until in the past 10 years or so. But you create a strong culture. And we some people call that the brand inside. Mm -hmm. And then that emanates through the corporate workplace. You know, and by corporate, I just mean your company workplace, as well as out to the consumer's perception of your brand. So if I, if I work in a work for a company, can I can I kind of are there things out there that say this is what I'm kind of looking for in a good culture? Are there certain things I'm looking for? Maybe if I'm older or if I'm millennial or to, to be hired? There? Yeah, well, no. If I'm an employee and I want to say we got to, what am I thinking if I think I'm in a good culture? What what makes that from my employee standpoint? Right. Well, if if you're an employee somewhere and you love the culture, it's simply because it's meeting your needs. Okay. And those needs, and this is funny to say this, but uh, the key to creating engagement that therefore creates what we call a, consider a strong culture is meeting your needs. And so that's you know, part of the magnet, right? In, in a way, the whole magnet is the, it's the same thing when we're trying to create magnetic tension with a customer, the same thing is used to create magnetism with our employees. And so I look at you the same way I would look at a customer and I say, okay, you're my employee. What do you want? Well, I know the first thing you want is a paycheck. Right. And so, you know, that's obviously one of the... Uh, so i got to be happy with what I'm getting paid. You've got to be happy with what you're getting paid. And now, a lot of the biggest, strongest cultures are cultures where that's not necessarily the case, but I'll get to why that is in a minute. But, but if you just start at the bottom, and I always start with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which was simply a theory in the 50s that psychologist Abraham Maslow came up with that just sort of outlined all the different things that a human being might need at any point. And he also explained that they kind of go in a sequential order, that you got to start with, you know, am I about to die? Am I surviving? Am, am I in any kind of threat? And, and once those questions are answered favorably, then people begin to evolve up into different kinds of needs, um, all the way up to, uh, you know, what we would consider psychosocial needs or um, existential needs, you know, maybe philosophical needs. Um, but every employee has that. And then, of course, it's different for every company. But if you just kind of think through the different things that make a person comfortable like you got to have pay and benefits right you've got to have an operational system when i give you a job and tell you to go do something it can't be too frustrating in fact it has to be kind of satisfying to be able to nail it when you do the thing the way you're supposed to do it and all mm -hmm. the systems work you know if the printer's broken all the time or if you have to fax things to seven different locations and you end up missing supper every day those are operational things that contribute to how engaged you are with the workplace 
And then there's also, also you know, workload is one, stress load is one, how well I match your personal strengths to the job that I assign you to do. Right. Um, so there's all of these just sort of basic blocking and tackling qualities. Things, and the reason we never think about these is because nine times out of 10, most of those are just naturally in a good place. And we miss it a lot of times when later on, you know, things start to go haywire, we're not really sure what it is. And um, when I go into a company, I actually assess for 15 categories or, or checkpoints. And that's just more than the, the natural brain mm -hmm. thinks about. So if you don't have a framework to, to draw from, then you're just kind of gonna say, well, he's not really happy right now, and I'm not really sure why, and he probably doesn't even know exactly why. And then once those bottom things are in place, you know, people sort of like Maslow predicted that there's sort of a next level of need that gets starts to show up, and that's when people like you say, you know, this is a good job and everything, but I I kind of want to move up in the in the in my career, and so you know the ability to advance your career is another one, and um, you know you also need to know the vision of where this is all leading. You know, this can't just be same day. What's my future? Or yeah, something like well, that. Well, not just you, but where are we going as a company? Mm. You know, am I? I'm pedaling really hard right now. Is the finish line up ahead anywhere? Um, so you kind of, and I think in terms of three-year increments, mm -hmm. that's a lot of companies do a three-year strategic plan mm -hmm. because that's about the right frame of reference for people to be able to to understand their personal context and how what I do today is impacting something. If it's 10 years, then it feels like I'm out in the middle of a desert, you know, pedaling and no, every stroke of the bicycle just doesn't even make a difference because the horizon looks exactly the same. So um, there's things like that. Um, another thing that employees need to, to feel like, you know, this is a great thing and I'm glad I'm here. Um, and, and you never know when these things are gonna show up, but they show up. Um, that you want somebody who is helping you uh, develop yourself personally and not just allowing you to develop personally but somebody who comes alongside you A and mental. says yeah we call it uh, developing others and so um, you know I maybe I've done things in some companies they develop a whole career track like you may start out as a salesman and then you may move up to an account rep and then you know so on and so on so you know, if I as a company owner have done all of these things to think about ahead of time, to, to lay out some stepping stones for right. you, then that sort of is a signal to you that these people are looking to help me do the thing that I want to mm -hmm. do. Um, another thing that comes up is, uh, you know, what I would call the balance between results and relationships. Mm -hmm. And so there's this other concept in this sort of middle level of determining whether or not you like your work is, you know, am I overly concerned about the results that you give me, uh, or do I care about you as a person some too? Um, and on the other extreme, if I only care about you as a person and ignore the results, then a little alarm's gonna go off in your head. Um, and so this is just an interesting thing about psychology is that, you know, we're all wired to look for these things, and because you have a natural quest to experience fulfillment, and accomplishing work is one of the things that helps you experience fulfillment. If that gets out of whack on either side, then a little trigger is gonna go off in your brain and, and it won't be long until you are not as satisfied working here and you're not really sure why. Another one at the same level is the notion that I've gotta walk the walk that I talk. Uh, so the people around you, if I'm always talking about, you know, how much we care about our customers, but then you somehow figure out that I'm just saying that because that's what I think I'm supposed to say or that's what I want customers to hear, and then somehow you pick up on little subtle things that makes you realize that I'm really all I care about is how my bank's filling up at your expense. Well, that's called authenticity. And so there has to be something genuine about the workplace that's just consistent between the values that we proclaim and what comes out of me naturally. So whatever this DNA is that we're going to choose for our company, it really has to trace back to a little bit of my DNA as the owner of the company. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, when I do leadership models for companies, it actually begins with a deep introspection with the leaders of the company. 
because and we go back and we we ask them their first memory as a child and all the way back to try to figure out what makes them tick because that's what's going to naturally come out of them when they lead this company and it needs to be what the company is trying to say naturally makes them tick yeah so that's how it gets consistent i got you so is there any different difference if you're trying to hire millennials versus anybody else huge, what is, what's the main key on that huge difference now a lot of companies don't even get to this because everything i've described to you so far is accomplished through the disciplines of management like if you're if you study and understand management you will understand the basic blocking and tackling of I've, I've got to cover pay and benefits i've got to have hiring and training it has to be clear I've got to be able to um, select people a certain way. I've got to have operations that are all dialed in so people don't get frustrated. I've got to make sure their workload is a certain way. I've got to make sure their stress load is right, and I've got to make sure that they're put into the right position that matches their skill set. Everything I just described is a management skill. That's the byproduct of being a good manager, and you have to go to management school or read a book or whatever to learn how to do those things. If I do those things and you've accomplished what we call a management culture, okay. Okay, which isn't great, but it's a good start. Right. Once those are in place, then we move up to things that are achieved through the skill of leadership. And that's where I talked about vision, because you've got to know where we're going in the next three years. I talked about you know working to develop you and help you develop yourself. Um, there has to be a sense of, of relevance and innovation um, mm -hmm. as part of leadership. Um, this idea of balancing results and relationships is a leadership skill. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, being authentically connected to who I am um, and the things you know that I'm suggesting that you do. Those values have to be consistent. That is leadership skills. Most companies are still wrestling with that. And remember, Maslow told us, that we wouldn't get to these millennial skills un unless these things were all in place. Um, in other words, you could put all the millennial you know, trinkets around the, the workspace, but nobody cares about that if their paychecks, you know, unsatisfactory mm -hmm. or something like that. But to answer your question, um, something that's different with millennials is that, and it's really not a millennial thing as much as it is just where society is in terms of its so they, they don't shoulder all the blame then, right? Well, civilization as a whole, if you think about it, it's now been coming up on 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. And so yeah. what that means is canned food. You know, there was a time when there was no canned food, you know, and that's this stuff down here. It's like, where's my next meal going to come from? Well, several generations of having food not be a big question for everybody. Um, goes by and, and just like so that's automatic we just assume that yeah well we take it for granted yeah. so it's what we call a commodity now okay and actually so is uh you know my career advancement and everything all these things that leadership provides you know we've been reading leadership books for 50 years now so all those things are commodities too most of the kids coming up today think yeah i'm going to go to college and i'm going to get a job what's the big deal you know if you go back 75, 100 years, that was not the attitude that people brought. So it's not so much that the yeah. kids who we call millennials are different, but it's where civilization as a whole is in its age. So it's not a matter of being you know, born and being 20 years old today. It's a matter that civilization itself is about you know, 150 years old in this season that it's in. So, so just like Maslow described, you know, once we once we get to where we think you know the can of food is a commodity and my career path and future and understanding all the things you know leadership um, you know it gives me a little bit of, of esteem to have a title the way leadership does um, and it lets me know that i can build my life and have fulfill the american dream uh, once those are in place only then do we start to see what we call millennial desires you know, and that's why we blame it on the generation, but it's really a byproduct of where civilization is right now. You and I are millennials too, um, even though we're outside of that uh, generation, uh, because there's something about us that's starting to reach this next level. All right, so what is this next level? This next level is something that Maslow had a name for, the psychologist I was telling you about. Um, he called it self-actualization. 
you know, maybe a better word for it in our terms is just um, self-realization or self-expression. But it's this idea that, you know, once we have food in our belly and once we have, you know, a, a retirement account in the bank, now we're starting to sit around and think about the significance of who we are. Right. Uh, we're starting to think about how do I, you know, what's my purpose and how do I matter in the world? And so that's when we reach the next level. So only if all these other things are met, which they are for this generation, and now we're all of a sudden looking at the self-actualization desires. And I'm going to tell you what they are in a second. But what you have to realize is that this is the first time in the history of mankind that the majority of the workforce has reached this level in what Maslow described as the hierarchy of needs. In other words, there's always been some people who were self-actualizing, you know, certain uh, members of royalty maybe, certain yeah. artists who were... Entertainers. Yep. Um, but now we're looking at the, the core workforce is made up of, or at least in, in part, uh, people who are self-actualizing. So even the bottom of the middle class has commoditized some of these things. Right. And so they're starting to reach that place where they're asking identity questions and significance questions and things like that. Well, there's two ways that need can get met. I can either come to work and punch the clock and then go do what I'm really concerned about, or smart companies are the ones who try to embed those into the work experience for people. Mm -hmm. And so this is what Google and Facebook and some of these Apple, some of the companies that we all look at and go, wow, what a great workplace, because they're building these desires into it. So what are these desires? They're real simple. <clears throat> I don't want to just do a job. I want to master a craft. And so even though it may be just putting paper into the printer, you know, there has to be something about that that makes the way I do it special. And you'll notice that, you know, lately in the past 10 years, there's all this emphasis on craft beer and things that are craft handmade. You know, there's sort of a return to the way things were before the industrial machines made them for us. There's a real value and appreciation for that. And that's just a signal that when we see things like that, it's connecting us back to how significant it is for the person to be involved in the production or the creation of that of that thing. So, so ownership. Craft yeah. is the first thing. We don't want to just do a job. We want to master a craft. In other words, we want to be good at something. Mm -hmm. The second one is that we have to have a sense of purpose in our work. Now, again, if you don't offer me the chance to do that on my job, I can go find somewhere else to do it on the weekends, which means that you're in competition with whatever that thing is on the weekend if you're my employer now. So your best bet is to make it happen right here. Yeah. So I want to do work that matters in the world. You know, and this is why you'll see, you know, the Apple employees so excited to be there. And what they're thinking subconsciously in the back of their mind is, you know, we are on the cusp of the greatest inventions, this innovation. And here I am, I get to wear the Apple thing. I don't have a clue how the thing works. You know, all I know is that I can stand here and be identified with this company that matters in the world right now. Right. And so that's satisfying my desire to matter in the world or to be part of a cause. Some people consider their cause to be a, a cosmic thing or a, an eternal thing. You know, they may want to go into ministry or join the Peace Corps or do something that we would consider truly transcendent. Um, but it's just as easy to solve that by letting people do anything that matters in the world. Companies can get involved in that by, you know, building that into their company, by celebrating that value. Um, some companies do it by borrowing from another. They may adopt a nonprofit that sort of shows up all the time in mm -hmm. their experience. Um, but that's how you build cause into a company. So we, we said you want to be good at something. And we observed too that you want to belong to, uh, that you want to uh, we said that you want to be good to something and we observed too that you want to believe in something so those are the those are two okay. the third one is what we call community so we got craft cause and now community and this is intuitive you'll recognize it it's the sense that i don't want to just show up and do a job that i want to be a part of this community of the workplace um, i want to have relationships i want to have a role that that is unique to me 
that not just anybody could do. I don't want to be a number. I don't want to be a cubicle guy. Right. Um, that I want to be part of a team. And so this is a sh subtle shift for a lot of companies. Um, it just simply means that you know I'm going to create a sense of belonging. I'm going to celebrate team unity. I'm going to celebrate the the accomplishments that people do together. That's something that a self-actualizing worker wants that they didn't really have 50 years ago as much. And so craft, I want to be good at something. Cause, I want to believe in something. And community, I want to belong to something. Those are the three desires that are new to this generation. Because of the self-actualization. And we call those the traits of the millennial. And the because way we as parents gave them all that stuff and all made, them, made them good on those two levels and now they're looking for that. Yep. third level if you will. and so if you've got millennial employees yeah um, obviously it's not going to do you any good to focus on those three if you don't have if that. you haven't mastered these down here and I'll tell you even with the big companies that I work with 99% of the time is spent down fixing uh, gaps that are existing down here and here's the thing the results when we fix these things are astronomical and it's just amazing because nobody's ever thought about them as a holistic unit. Yeah. That they're what we call this whole thing makes up what we call the employee value proposition. Okay. And if I offer you a proposition that has so much value, it's going to magnetize and draw you into whatever it is I'm trying to create because he who feeds leads. Mm -hmm. And when I do that with 10 employees, now all of a sudden I have what you call a culture and people look at that and they go, I don't know what that is, but it's just in their DNA. And all I've done is I've figured out what makes you tick, and I'm pushing all the right buttons so that I keep you engaged in your work. That's the bottom line, really. Yeah. So, you, you know. And, and the return on investment is just so much there. Well, <clears throat> do you find the people that are bringing you in, the people at the top, do they get re excited about what they're doing with the company? You know, it's funny because. This is viewed as such a soft thing, you know. It's people think of culture and they think of HR initiatives and things like that. Well, these aren't HR initiatives at all. This is the first time that people are looking holistically at the whole picture. You know, the one of the reasons that the return on investment is so just astronomical. I'm talking it was five thousand to one in the first company I introduced this. Within three years they went from growing at five percent to growing at thirty percent. And this was a a larger company but the the dollars were just the Big. return on investment to them was enormous well people get you know the reason that there's so much opportunity here is because not because it's this new turn that if we figure it out but it's because we've done so poorly at it up until now um, you know Gallup started measuring engagement in 1990 and the first year they measured it was something, you know, in the 20% range, which means that 80% of the workforce was is, not engaged. is not engaged. Yeah. And, you know, some people say that engagement accounts for 40% of the product productivity or the output of, a, of an employee. So imagine, you know, if I'm paying somebody $10 an hour, well, 40% is a range of, you know, $4. So I may be getting $8 worth of work out of you. Or, if I've got a great culture, I'm getting $12 worth of work for the price of $10 an hour. Um, so there's a huge uh, swing, and I think it's even bigger when you synergize all the people together who are all on the same page and engaged and excited about what they do. Otherwise, you wouldn't go from 5% growth to 30% growth with the same people in three years. Okay, so Ben, I remember when we were talking before, you were telling me about thoughtmosphere. Yeah. Tell our audience a little bit about Thoughtmosphere. Give them a little, little so, piece of it. Yeah, so probably people didn't even, they're thinking they didn't hear the word right. It's Thoughtmosphere. Um, and it's just, you know, like an atmosphere is the air we breathe. Thoughtmosphere is this, you know, the thoughts we think. If they were to form a, a bubble around your like head. Like a cloud or if something. If I could see it, if I could see like a bubble around your head of all Would the things. Would have hair on it? All the things you're thinking right now. <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's a very similar to like if I had a space helmet on, you know, that everybody's head is surrounded by whatever's on their mind, you know, so that's just sort of the word picture. And the thing, the reason that's important when it comes to culture is just the way people are that, you know, we live in an attention economy, attention economy. So 
you know, whatever I do is closely related to what I'm thinking about. And this is stuff that's been studied by psychologists for years, but it's even more predominant now because we have all of these, you know, different messages that we're processing at every given moment. Right. All right. So in other words, if I were to, you know, talk about something or, you know, in other words, I could even change the pace of your work just by the soundtrack that I create around you. If I sort of talked slower and created this environment where everything was methodical and, you know, after a while, that would begin to impact sort of the pace that your brain processes and the way you do things. I can do the same thing by emphasizing certain things. If there's something that my company's passionate about, well, I need to play that like a soundtrack in your world. Oh, uh, okay. And if I surround they your world... Make it part of me. Right. And so here's the thing. Most companies under-communicate by 300%. And I think that's actually, that's according to one study, I think it's actually 3,000%. Because, you know, in the past 50 years, we've gone from three TV channels and whatever your local radio picked up to a thousand channels on your TV and internet and everything else and then of course all your friends have their own channels now their Twitter accounts and everything else so we are constantly bombarded with different messages and the one that you're thinking about is which message it's not the one you care about the most it's the one that just showed up yeah and so if I'm running a company and I've got 10 employees I have no control over what they're thinking at any given moment but if I think like a media company and I begin to plot and strategize ways to trickle in the things that I want you to be thinking about and you know the old school way of doing this is the bulletin board you mm -hmm. know and then I'll hang out with you by the water cooler and we'll look up and see something that's supposed to be important and then you know we'll go right back about our lives and nothing interrupts us because we didn't have cell phones right but nowadays I've got to think about ways to introduce in a relevant way the things that I want to reinforce. And so we'll see a lot of companies going back to morning meetings, afternoon meetings. Okay, meetings themselves can be boring, but we'll see companies investing in videos. We'll see companies essentially creating all of these artifacts that you surround your employees with expressions of the values that you're trying to create with so that your culture. So that be a company Facebook page and Twitter account maybe? Or Those not? are the obvious ones. Uh -huh. um, and it's different for every company. But there has to be ways, like I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, sometimes there's there's a, uh, you know, this, this Slack tool, the, the app Slack is a good way. Essentially text messaging or, the, or a similar medium is the best way to just jump in front of your employees because they're going to look at it. yep they're going to they're going to look at it you want to get people active on that so that they're not you know not thinking that. about other things while they're working you want so, to keep their brain here's the thing so if, if i'm a if i'm an entrepreneur and i've started a company and it's me and one other person or whatever and i'm trying to bring in more people and i want to grow my company i think from what my first thought is i got to feel good about my product right mm -hmm. i got to feel like i have a sustainable product or sustainable service so if i'm that person i've got one or two employees and i want to start bringing in other employees do i need to start now start thinking about those bottom line pieces and those next level pieces if, if everybody should start with the with the management disciplines management disciplines. everybody should start with thinking about how does how do i break it down into pieces how does my company provide value to my employee and you know first of all there's pay and benefit now just staying on the management discipline there's pay and benefits okay mm -hmm. there's training and onboarding you know do you feel like you're equipped with knowledge to do the thing that i'm right. asking you to do that can be very frustrating right if i'm new and don't know much about it right? right if i don't provide the right kind of coaching and feedback to, because some people don't learn by reading a manual or watching a video and they're going out and trying to do it some people learn kinesthetically they need you to go stand there with them and say okay now you try it does that make sense to you or do you want me to show you again um, so that's just training. That's just one of the seven disciplines in this management level. And then, you know, I've got to make sure that your workload makes sense and isn't crazy. Your stress load, you know, if I've got you, you know, the old statistic that ambulance drivers, you know, would hang around for about two years and then they move on something. Well, it's because it's stressful. 
You know, so I've got to pay attention to balancing the stress load. All of those management disciplines. And I, but if I'm young, each time I bring somebody in, I got to think about that with that. Person. If you create the system that, as a management system, then they just creates value it. for you. Then I could just drop you in there. This okay. is why that part's not necessarily scalable. It doesn't have to be scaled to work. Um, but I just create this system, and once I've built it one time, I just have to maintain it. And then I can move up to the leadership disciplines, and then I can start thinking about more advanced things to meet okay. your more advanced needs. That, make, that makes sense. Okay, so this has been great. It's been real helpful and, and knowledgeable, and I know a lot of our folks are going to get a lot from this. And one of the things I always like to ask people when I kind of finish up is, I want to know how you think. I want to know what your tape is. I want to know what you say to yourself. When you're in front of something that's adverse or you're trying to pep yourself up, do you have any self-talk? Do you have a tape that you play? Well, everybody has self-talk. Do is, you have a certain piece, a certain self-talk? Do you script your self-talk yourself or do you let somebody else write yeah. that script for you? Absolutely. Well, I mean, so What like, are some of the things you say to I'm, yourself? I, you know, okay, so you know, I'm not a perfect person, so I'm not trying to say that I don't ever have any negative thoughts. You right. know, I just uh, have shared with you before how certain circumstances come up and I immediately start worrying about them and everything. Well, you know, for me, I mean, just to be honest with you, I think the fundamental belief in me is that God has a purpose in everything. So would you say that God has a purpose for me? I say it all the time. How in, many times a day do you say that? Uh, well, it depends on the day. <laughs> but um, it's kind of like pray without ceasing. You yeah. know, that just has to be the attitude. That's your walk. And, and uh, you know, if you look on the, the whiteboard around this room, it won't take long till you'll see a statement of affirmation similar to that that um you know in some form or fashion but that's the main thing is i just for whatever reason was you raised in it? i was raised to i was told from the earliest i can remember that you know god has a purpose for me and you know he's going to work all things together for good and that doesn't mean that i'm not going to experience you know losses and pain and everything else and but i've been able to study throughout years you know from history different characters in the Bible and so forth right. and how, um, you know, I think that my currency is different too. My currency is not, you know, the, the United States dollar or anything else that, that I'm able to be invested in things that are from an eternal kingdom. And Hello. so, um, you know, I can take a hit financially, you know, in my circumstances without it really hitting me in the real bank. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that comes up so as self-talk. things about that, knowing that. Yeah, that, I don't know how people do it without faith. Um, I think and I don't mean to. I, I, you I need admire something. them. You I need guess, something. Yeah. You need they have something. something. They have yes. faith in something, I guess. But um, you know, I feel like I'm an optimist, and not everybody in my family is an optimist. Uh, so a lot of times, I feel I end up saying these things a lot of times because I'm trying to you know encourage them yeah your kids um, yep kids spouse others. <laughs> well hey that concludes our, our our rock star interview with ben ortlip and uh, ben's an awesome guy and, and um and and he's got some stuff coming out in the future i think will be be fun do we want to talk about any of that no not yet so anyway um Ben's a great guy, and I, and I hope you enjoyed this time with Ben. I hope you've learned something about how you can create a more dynamic culture in your business. And, and uh, thank you for tuning in to Local Rock Stars.